Bidit Gujarati is on fire. He has just leapfrogged 12 places in the FIDE Top 100 list from 28 to 16. And even more impressive, he just won the FIDE Grand Swiss. Not only is this a huge tournament with the best players in the world, it also is a qualifier for the candidates. That means he will now be able to play in the tournament to determine who will play for the world championship. And I have to say, without Magnus involved, he has as good a chance as any. The game we're going to look at today was from the FIDE Grand Swiss. His opponent, the American Hans Niemann, who had a decent tournament himself. In this game, Bidit has the white pieces. Hans Niemann has black. Let us jump right in. E4 is the opening move. E5, knight F3, knight C6, and bishop to B5. Grandmaster Gujarati plays the Spanish opening. A6 is played, so no Berlin defense today. And bishop to A4, knight to F6, puts pressure on the E4 pawn. White castles, and yes, black can take on E4, and that's the open Spanish. That's a different line. But bishop E7 is the most common move. Going for a closed Spanish. Rook to e1 now defends the pawn at e4. b5 hits the bishop, bishop to b3, and castle. So in this position, if white plays c3, black has the option of playing d5 in one go. And this is the martial attack, and this is a, a great weapon, basically. Black gets a, a very strong attack for a pawn, and if that attack doesn't work out, he can usually hold the draw. Uh, anyway, so most players at the top level do not go into this. They play what's called an anti-martial, and that's what Grandmaster Gujarati does here. He plays a4. Uh, the idea is that this d5 move becomes stronger because white has played c3. That takes away a natural square for the knight and also weakens the light squares. So by not playing c3, d5 loses some of its strength, though it is technically still playable. Uh, but here, bishop to b7 was played to defend the rook at uh, a8 because there was a pin down the a-file. d3 is played, keeping things tight, overprotecting the e4 pawn, and probably going to go after this b5 pawn and some play, play against uh, black's queen side. d6, bishop to d2. This keeps the knight from going to a5, where it would harass the bishop at b3 and clear the way for the pawn to advance to c5. Queen to d7, h3 keeps uh, any pieces out of the g4 square, and now knight to d8. The knight, ha knight has to go a different way, but it clears the way for the c-pawn, and now it's going to route to e6 and try to find action in the center of the board. a b5, a b5, rook a8, bishop takes a8, and uh, knight to c3, putting pressure on black's position. Now, the pawn at b5 isn't hanging. Uh, the knight can go to d5 at some point. Uh, it's just the little pressure. That's the nature of the Spanish opening. You're always applying slight pressure to your opponent, and eventually that can really add up over time. The knight goes to e6, where it can pop into d4 or f4. So here, uh, Vidit immediately takes that knight off the board. He gives up the bishop pair, uh, but he creates a few more pawn weaknesses, and black does take with the f pawn. Uh, that plugs up these squares. Obviously, if he takes with the queen, then the, the b5 pawn would hang. Uh, it plugs up these squares, but all of a sudden, Black's structure is looking a little raggedy. It has its strengths, it has its weaknesses, but uh, he's beginning to accumulate little uncomfortable elements to his position. Uh, at the moment, Black is threatening b4, kicking this knight away, so White goes ahead and plays b4 preemptively, uh, and that also, again, puts uh, fixes that pawn on a b5 square. Bishop to b7 to allow the rook to come to a8 and contest the a-file. Queen to a1. Basically what white is doing, he wants to play the queen to b2 once the rook comes to a8, and then play his own rook to a1. And that, that way he prevents black from getting any activity on the a-file. Rook to a8, queen to b2, h6 is played, and now rook to a1, challenging that rook. And we can see how black's pawns, they're not, it's not, you know, just little uncomfortable elements, you know. Some weaknesses, e6, b5, this structure on the king side, just little things, but they add up. Rooks come off the board, king to f7, and now queen to a7. White's queen is able to penetrate down the a-file. He's hitting the bishop at b7, and he has a target here that this uh, on the c7 pawn, which could become a real problem for Hans Niemann. Uh, there's some real pressure developing against c7. The bishop goes to c6, sort of keeping everything tight, adding to a defender, adding a defender to the b5 pawn. The queen holds the c7 pawn. But now it's about applying pressure and seeing if black's position will break underneath that pressure. Queen to a5 is played by Vidit. Uh, 
attacking b5 twice. Now, it is defended twice, but again, if something were to happen to the bishop or queen, the pressure on b5 would, would become a problem. The king goes to g8, now bishop to e3. That's nothing more than putting the bishop on a better square. d2, it controls fewer squares. On e3, it controls more squares. It's just a, just a nicer diagonal for the bishop. King goes back to h7, and we can kind of see Hans Niemann is struggling for a plan here. He's sort of repeating moves and daring white to attack something. He says, I've got everything defended. Let's see if you can apply enough pressure to win something. Bishop goes to a7. So this is his idea. The bishop is going to b8 to attack the c7 pawn twice with the queen and the bishop. The bishop goes to d8 to defend that pawn a second time. Queen to a6, applying pressure. The bishop can go to b8. The queen can go to a7. Bishop goes back to e7. Bishop to b8. King to g8, and knight to b1 was played. Queen to a7, bishop d8, and black has everything covered. So uh, there's that old rule, what do you do about your worst placed piece? And in this case, this knight at c3 can find a better place to land. So the knight goes to b1, and it's got a long journey, but when it lands on that square, it will be very strong. d2, b3, a5. In this case, the knight on the side of the board is strong aiming for that a5 square. The knight goes to h5, the black's knight, aiming at the f4 square. g3 keeps it out. The bishop goes back to d8. Knight b to d2, continuing that journey from b3 to a5. Queen to e8. Basically, uh, to remove the bishop on c6 is a target. Once the knight ends up on a5, both the knight and the queen will be aiming at that bishop. So by playing the queen back, now the bishop can move away from the, the uh, incoming threats. Uh, knight to b3 immediately is still pretty strong, but Vidit plays king to f1 instead, centralizing the king. Knight to f6, and again, knight b3 is strong, but he plays king to e1, king to h7, and we can see it's sort of a wait and see for black just as Vidit begins to build up his forces. King to e2, queen to d7, king to d1, we can see the king moving over to the queen side. Knight to g8, and now knight to b3, and uh, Grandmaster Gujarati. Gujarati finally begins the key maneuver, moving this knight to the a5 square while black has to sit and wait. This is a classic Spanish torture, as they say of the Spanish opening. Knight to e7 defends the c6 bishop. Knight to a5 attacks it. Queen to e8. Now he's threatening, uh, Hans Niemann is threatening to activate the queen via h5, and that's a real, can be a real concern for white. He does have to worry about that uh, queen becoming active. So he plays king to e2 first, because the queen could go to h5. It would give up the bishop, but he'd attack the knight on f3, threatening to take it with check. So king to e2 tightens things up. But now d5, gaining central space. And uh, at the moment, black is threatening this e4 pawn. It's attacked twice. Um, if knight takes e5, then queen to h5 check is actually a good move, obviously attacking the king and the knight, but the knight can interpose and save itself. But after bishop to d7, black is actually doing uh, okay here. There's pressure on the h3 pawn. Uh, the knight, while it cannot be captured right now, is vulnerable, and black's holding things. This would be a pretty equal uh, equal position. So Vidit does not take that pawn at e5. Instead, he plays the knight to d2. You can see with d5, a weakness was created on c5. He spots this immediately and begins a possible maneuver to that square. Queen to h5, check. King to e1. Bishop to d7. Queen to b7, attacking the c7 pawn twice. Now, bishop to e8 is a possibility, uh, and bishop c7 could be played. Um, but after queen to h3, it looks like black is surviving. He just gives up the bishop at d8, but then bishop h5, and he's threatening all kinds of checks on h1. For example, if bishop goes ahead and takes the knight, then Hans Niemann could play queen to h1, check, knight f1, queen to f3 with a threat of mate on e2. After king d1, excuse, d2, excuse me, queen to d1, check, forcing king to c3. And after queen to a1, check, he actually, actually has a perpetual check. He can just go back and forth, and uh, the game would end in a draw. Um, so instead, d e4 was played by Hans Niemann. d e4. Now queen takes h3, grabbing the h-pawn. And now Vidit takes on c7. Queen to h1, check. So we see, basically, white has won the game positionally with the pawn weaknesses and all of these threats. The question is, can Hans Niemann keep the white king occupied 
and keep him from taking advantage of uh, those weaknesses. King moves to e2, the queen goes back with check, and now knight to f3, and we can see the e5 pawn is now attacked twice by the bishop and the knight, so it looks like the pawn is going to fall. Uh, queen back to e8, knight takes e5. Uh, the threat, of course, for white is actually take on d8, and then the bishop on d7 would, uh, would be hanging. So to prevent that, bishop to c8 is played by Hans Niemann. Here, queen to e7 was played. Uh, queen to b6 uh, was a pretty good move. After bishop c7, queen c7, you see black's pieces are frozen in place. They just can't go anywhere. They all defend each other, and if one moves, then the other piece would fall. After queen to h5 check, king e3, queen g5 check, king to d3, black has run out of checks, and uh, white can has time to do everything. He can reroute the knight, and uh, black just has to sit there and wait while knight, while Vidit would get a great position and basically just win the game. He's stuck, basically. But queen goes to a7, knight to g6, challenging the knight on e5. Bishop takes d8. If, if knight g6, queen g6, bishop d8, queen to e4, check. And black would get a lot of activity here. Uh, it takes a computer to show that white could escape the checks, however. So that was a possibility. Um, knight e to c6 is the computer's idea, and it is very strong. It really freezes black's position. After bishop c7, queen takes c7, we can see again uh, black's position, pieces are really tied down, and he's in, in big trouble. Uh, but instead, bishop takes d8 was played. Knight takes, D, knight takes e5. If Hans Niemann takes on d8, then knight g6, king g6, knight c6. After queen to e8, queen to c7, again, you have the same kind of position where there are no immediate tactics, but white is completely winning because black can't do anything. He just has to wait for white to just get an ideal position and break through. There's nothing he can do. So you, you don't want that. So instead, he takes the knight on e5. And now, Vidit plays queen to c7. This move does allow... Uh, Hans back into the game. The computer show this uh, incredible shot. Bishop to f6. Attacking the knight, threatening mate on g7, and taking advantage of the pin. That's why the bishop cannot be taken. Um, and after knight f7, queen to e7. The queens are traded, and uh, this endgame heavily favors, uh, favors white. He's up a pawn and just has a better position. Uh, but instead, queen to c7 was played. Queen to h5 check. King to d2. And the one move black needed to sort of hold this game together is bishop to d7. This might allow him, after, say, bishop to e8, to keep things together. He plays knight to f3 check, which looks strong, but uh, he's sort of pushing Vidit's king to where it wants to go. King c3, queen to h1, obviously trying to create some threats along this diagonal, just going after the king. Now king to b2. Now white's king looks like it might be safe, and uh, he's keeping his, adv his extra advantages, his extra pawn, his extra, his better pieces, but now knight to d2, and Hans Niemann has a very serious threat. The threat of queen to b1 check is a real problem. So how does Vidit defend against this threat? He sees the move here, bishop to f6, the only move to win, a brilliant move. Again, he has the pin on the g-pawn. He's threatening mate on g7. But more importantly, this bishop controls the a1 square, which limits the black's queen's ability to check white's king. Queen to b1 check, king to a3, and we see the queen cannot check at, uh, at a1. That's a big issue. Uh, if king c3, then knight to e4 check, and black would actually win because of the fork in picking up this bishop. King to a3, queen to c1 check, and now bishop back to b2. And in this position, Hans Niemann resigned. Obviously, he still, Vidit still has a threat of mate at g7, uh, but knight to b1 check doesn't work, because after king to a2, the queen can come back to g5 to defend against mate. The problem is the knight would fall, and that would be decisive material. A great win from Vidit Gujarati. We're going to have to pay a little bit more attention. He's now in the mix for the big crown. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you again soon at Chess Talk. Goodbye.